production. Thank you, Sergeant Lopez, for all the hard work. I've been a little bit busy, and so I've been a little bit last minute. To be honest, I'm often a little bit last minute. Um, and I'd also like to thank Lieutenant Colonel Christensen for putting up uh, Christian for putting up with me and repeatedly chasing me via email to get stuff done for it. So let's before we go into the brief, let's talk about what this is going to be and what this isn't going to be and what the genesis of this is. So if you are looking for, as the general said, if you're looking for battalion brigade tactics, you could feel free to switch off this brief, right? That's not what you're doing. But if you want to understand what higher is going to be, the approaches higher might take that are the context for what your brigades and battalions are going to do, this might be useful. And if you are going to work on a staff and are a planner, right, the number one and two things you owe a boss are tailorable options, distinct, scalable, and tailorable options that meet an intent. What we're going to do here is we're going to talk through the menu of all possible options, right? I'm not going to tell you which option to take because they're all conditions-based. So we're going to talk about what are the conditions that direct each option. Some of these options, such as destroying a city, are probably not going to be options that I'm going to be very happy if I see one of you all taking, you know, and just like flattening a city. But it is an option. So we're going to talk about the options. And it also might be an option for your, your, yeah, your, your adversary. adversary. The other thing to think about is that I'm going to give, a, because we're going to go through a lot and quickly, I'm going to give very touched on examples. I'm just going to mention examples or analogies where this has been where these options have been tried. And I'm not going to go into depth on them. That said, I am happy to go into further depth on any of these options and any of the examples in questions, in discussion afterwards, however you want. But really what I'm here to do is kind of present options. It's organized as kind of the by categories. And I will say, this isn't an exact reprise of the talk last year, because General Woldridge and I had some good dialogue and he forced me to go back and reframe as you know any good leader does and think about the options I was giving. So there are slight changes from where they are in the gray book. With that, let's get going. Oh, also, disclaimer, I don't represent anyone here besides myself. On the other hand, if you want to talk about coming to Sam's, talk to me. All right, go next slide, please. All right, so we're going to talk about some general considerations for driving an operational approach. Then we're going to talk about the offensive options. And then if we have time, which we won't, I have a couple backup slides on what you do after the offense, after your offense has been successful. What are some of the considerations then? Again, these are things we can talk about after because I'm pretty sure we're not going to have time to talk about them directly. Um, next slide, please. So some of these general considerations as we go through are things you've been hearing about all week. But there are some questions here, definitionally. There isn't actually a good definition of urban versus rural. And so one of the foundation things is when do these options apply? Well, honestly, when do you think they do? What does rural mean historically? It just means literally the area that is not urban, which is a super helpful definition. So when do they apply when you think they do? Another issue to consider that drives all of this is force density, right? We've talked about the compressing nature of urban terrain as um very glad dr king is here as uh, dr king has written eloquently in his book and has talked about right we don't have the real force capacity to achieve the kind of historic force density in dense urban terrain in a high tempo operation right that doesn't exist in our force structure currently so when we're talking about some of these historical examples we probably can't do them the way they were done historically. If you look at, I believe the example of Dr. King's book, he uses Stalingrad for that, and how many divisions were necessary to even have the Stalingrad fight, and let alone the envelope around it. Another thing is some of these options will be constrained by force structure. Our force isn't structured to do them, full stop. Now we can talk again about how we might handle that. Another one, and uh, I'm glad uh, Stuart Lyle isn't sitting in the audience because he'd throw things at me at this, is um, that terrain favors the defense in urban, except, as you'll see when we talk about the defense, there are exceptions to this. We've talked about civilians in the battle space. We've talked about maintaining sustainment in and medevac and the problems thereof in the urban space. We've talked about the issues of intelligence. We've talked about, hopefully, and maybe I missed this, but we've talked about the necessity to transition 
to follow on operations and stability. And then the key challenge is throughout all these options of how to maintain combat power, tempo, unit coherence, and avoid culmination and that the enemy in the urban space has the ability to inflict pain and then move on, right? These are all things you should be familiar with as a problem. Keep these in mind as we go through all of the options to see which options manage which of these. Next slide, please. One of the other things to think about in urban space, and I know doctrine is moving away from the phase and construct, but it is still a useful way to divide, is that phase four is continuous, right? A very smart British officer on a first course once said that every 10 meters of urban terrain you gain is 10 meters of humanitarian and stability operations you have to do. And this is absolutely true. Phase four is phase zero, one, and two of the defense, because at some point you're going to need to rest, you're going to need to refit, and you're going to be on the defense, at which point you're doing phase four at the same time. So phase zero, of the defense is phase four of the offense. Normal medical, and you have to also think really heavily of medical planning. In the urban terrain, medical planning is king with all of these operations. Why? Because when you think about normal medical needs of an urban space, they continue. And they're not necessarily what our medical planners are used to handling and equipped well to hand. So if there are people on, who have heart disease, you need to plan to have nitro. Right, that's not something that's commonly in our medical kickback at enough for uh, area. You need insulin, you need lithium, right? Because you're going to have people with mental health and bipolarity and you know what you really don't want? And there's historical examples of that where a mental health care facility comes into your space and you run out of the drugs to keep the patients healthy. These are not things that tend to exist in the rural terrain. They are things that are absolutely part of the urban terrain. And so as you're thinking about planning and logistics considerations, think about all of the medical needs. How many babies are delivered per day in any given part of LA? What is our ability of our medical units to deliver those babies? And the reason this becomes important is because what happens if someone's wife dies in childbirth because they don't have medical services that you just failed to provide? I'd take that, that would code me pretty hostile, right? Don't know about the rest of you, but if you fail to provide a medical resource and you just killed my wife, as a result, I am now not coded friendly. I am now not coded neutral. I'm coming to get your ass, right? And that's where we have to think about in terms of some of the other planning considerations. So even before you're picking an option, in your OPT, you better have your med planners and your med people going, hey, what are the demographics of this urban terrain? What do I need that I don't have in my normal med kit, right? In our normal medical logistics. Are there issues like mental health care facilities in the area I'm going to operate? It's going to have to be part of the IPB because the medical team is going to need to know that because I'm willing to bet, and I know I've got some med planners sitting right up here in the front row. I'm willing to bet that they can't wake up in the morning and say, oh yeah, we got some more lithium coming in, not a problem, right? Or more uh, anti-anxiety drug. That's, we don't, you know, that's just coming right away with us. So that's forward planning, which is the other thing to think about with these options, is planning for the logistics, et cetera, begins a lot earlier than even selecting an option. All right, next, please. Before we get to that, there is one other thing to mention because we are like in this COVID, post-COVID world. Urban terrain and epidemics go together really, really, really nicely. So the first infantry rev re uh, regiment, for instance, not in urban terrain, but to give you an idea of how bad it can get, in the, South, in the South Pacific was rendered entirely combat ineffective and had to be scratched off due to scrub typhus because they weren't doing medical intelligence planning. They did not realize scrub typhus was in the area, right? In Naples, Naples is almost entirely wiped out on the edge of being wiped out in World War II because our fighting in Naples and our bombardment in Naples causes a critical collapse of the infrastructure, which then causes a typhus epidemic getting to over 700 people per week per facility dying and it comes to all of our soldiers so our soldiers start to get typhus we do mass ddt of uh, like ddt showers for the whole population but why were we able to do that we'd med plan that in advance in north africa in north africa after operation torch the forces that took part in operation torch 
specifically into cities, get a hepatitis hospitalization rate among our combat personnel of 17%. Because again, they're going into that dense urban area. They're not garrisoned off from the population. The infrastructure is broken. So think about that as well as what is your planning for epidemics within the urban space, especially if you're smashing the infrastructure. This should be undergirding all of your planning considerations. So what I'm saying is one of the switches is in your OPT, med planning needs to be right up in front and med intelligence needs to be part of your IPB. DOD has cut a lot of its med intelligence, right? If you go back to Vietnam, we had battalions. Worst of people doing this. Now I think it's 43 people in uh, Frederick, Maryland or similar, right? So think about how are you helping your two shop start to do that level of planning. Uh, Jacob, since we have some allies yep. here, an orders planning team, OPT, and I, I'm yep. glad that you're very institutionalized yep. in military language. D jargon. That is the first time someone's happened had to tell that to me, and that is a good sign professionally and a bad sign personally. Yeah, so uh, OPT is an operational planning team. They're, the, you're, they're when you're assembling your planning team for a given operation. I will try to de jargon a little bit here. All right, so let's talk about your offensive options. Go next, please. So here, when you're thinking about the elements of operational art in US doctrine, here are the ones that are going primarily be the factors to consider as you pick your operational approach. End state and conditions is going to drive everything. What are you trying to do here? Everything else is subordinate to that because you'll see some of these operational approaches, depending what you're trying to do, are highly unsuitable. Phasing and transitions, this is going to be something that you're going to have to manage across these approaches. You'll see some that highlight that this is a very complex problem. Tempo, tempo not being speed, tempo being the pace and frequency of your operations to avoid culmination and have the enemy culminate. Culmination, your inability to conduct further uh, operations and an uh, operational reach. How are you continuing to sustain your movement and your operations? So throughout, these are your factors that will drive which of these operational approaches you pick. It's a balance. Next, please. So let's talk about the first and potentially simplest option that maybe your adversary might do to you. Maybe I can't think of the scenario, but maybe we might choose to do as well, which is destroy the city. It is an option. It exists. Yeah, it was Cologne, Germany. Well spotted there. See, this is what I like is I've included some pictures there for Jason to do the name the picture. <laughs> All right. So an example of where we did this is Le Havre in France. That's what's left of Le Havre after we attack it. That's the city. So Le Havre was a critical port on the English Channel. We had gotten tired of fighting our way through heavy urban defenses of ports. And so our idea was we need to take the port, what's the quickest way to negate the German defense? Destroy the city. It achieves decisive results, right? We do achieve decisive results, no question. It saves time and casualties. It's taken us 30 days to capture some ports. We do Le Havre in under five, right? We have very low casualties on it. Now, what are civilian tendencies under bombardment? run or stay in place. If you're running, they're running to, towards you and you now have a civilian issue. If they're staying in place and you're destroying a city, you're destroying them too. So there are obvious human rights considerations. Another consideration that comes out of this is your own casualties to moral injury, right? How many psychiatric battle casualties are you going to sustain by people who do not like opening fire and just rubbling an entire city? Those won't be casualties you're going to feel immediately. They'll be casualties you'll feel in the next week or months following as they start to develop symptoms of moral injury, right? What are the long-term effects of civilian casualties? How will that population view you after you're done? Probably not like superheroes, right? And then it can create other problems such as disease as we've talked about. And finally, it may be unsuitable for you. Why may it be unsuitable for you? Because of this. They wanted the port of Le Havre, of, but it was over a month before they could even get basic port operations started again because it was so thoroughly destroyed. So when you think about it, yeah, took the city really quickly to get that port. 
well, we could have just done 30 days of fighting and had the port and the city and its infrastructure intact, or we could destroy it for five days and have 30 days rebuilding. Didn't really accomplish the objective. So there are times beyond where it just might not be the right choice, keeping the moral side aside. And obviously there is a huge moral and legal component to this. Next slide, please. So here are your destroy considerations again, right? And so what you owe the boss, you owe the boss a discussion of risk. So if boss comes and like, hey, we gotta move fast, I wanna destroy the city, right? Here's your discussion of risk. Well, sir or ma'am, you can, but here are the planning considerations to take. Next slide, please. So if you're not going to destroy it, the next kind of easy button is to assault it, right? If you can't destroy it, go through. Stalingrad. There we go. I don't even need captions. This is awesome. All right. Go next, please. So classic city assault. What I, you could call a deliberate assault. Good case study is Stalingrad. Ideally, what you do is you breach. You maneuver once you've breached, and then you exploit, right? This is the same with any deliberate assault in US doctrine. I didn't get a caption on this one. Ah, go next. All right, so what are the advantages and disadvantages? The advantage is it allows for consolidation of your force and consolidation of your gains, right? You breach, you then can maneuver and exploit, and so you can consolidate those gains. It allows for continuous and decisive operations. You can destroy the enemy, right? You can win it. It also allows for exploitation. What does that mean? It's got that final phase. If the enemy breaks, you can run rampant and take the city and move on beyond it to subsequent objectives. All of this really good. This is why it's often picked. But what are its disadvantages? It is force intensive. Right, going back to Dr. King's point on Stalingrad and how we don't have the force structure to be able to repeat that operation and the capability. It takes a lot to do. It also can be slow because it goes through these phases and traditions. Breach, maneuver, exploit. Well, if the breach does not fully dislocate the enemy, then what do you got to do again? Breach, right? And you get into this repeated breach, maneuver, breach, maneuver, breach, maneuver, right? It can also devolve into multiple unlinked fights. You breach, you maneuver, one part of your force does well, another part of your force is stuck. Now you have two different urban fights on your hand and you start to get into some of those wise urban hard questions. And it risks creating a gravitational pull of all of its own. What does this mean? It means that once, if your breach maneuver exploit doesn't work quickly, then you need more forces. You've probably culminated at this point. And so the city starts to exert a gravitational pull on the rest of the campaign as more forces have to flow to it to be able to make up for the fact that you were not successful. It risks rapid culmination. As we say, if the breach maneuver is not successful, then you're probably culminated. And it reaches lists high civilian casualties because you're going to be fighting through the city where those civilians are none of which is ideal. So again, this is how we're going to talk the whole time. We're going to talk, hey, here's the option. What are its advantages and disadvantages? So you know when to present that as an option. Go next slide, please. There are variations on assault. One of them is by this guy there, Jason. Monty. Monty, right? His theory of victory throughout the Second World War is what he called colossal cracks can have all kinds of amused chuckles when you feel free, right? The idea of colossal cracks is really to do the First World War right. What you do is you build and you mass combat power at a place in your, of your choosing, and you build until you're good and ready. And then you hit the enemy with everything you have. Very, very concentrated. You make a breach, right? Where it differates from a deliberate assault is you do not then move into a maneuver phase. You breach, then you build up your combat power again, and then you breach again. And the point of doing this is to attrit the enemy.
put the enemy in a position where they have to defend, where you mass your combat power, and then you attrit them, and you attrit them, and you attrit them until such point as they culminate, and so then you exploit. The purpose of this is that you're not really hitting that maneuver phase. So you're not really culminating ever because you, after every breach, are pausing and reconstituting your force. And you just keep attriting them till such point as they culminate. What does this mean? You don't actually have to make long distance success. You don't have to make maneuver. It can be very short because this is an enemy focused course of action and an enemy focused operational approach. There are plenty of historical cases through Montgomery's campaigns. El Alamein as an open battle is a particularly famous one. And it's one where he does it quite successfully, right? There's a breach where he breaches the German lines. The Germans culminate. They can't continue to sustain combat power in the area. And then he proceeds to exploit until such time as the Germans start to build combat power. And then he pauses, rebuilds. You also see this throughout Northern Europe. His one break from this approach, by the way, is um, Operation Market Garden, which does not work. So when you look at the Battle of Khan for an urban battle, for instance, this is his template for it. Go next, please. So what are your advantages? It reduces the chance of dissip uh, dissipation of effort over extension. You're not going to overextend. You're going to breach. And as soon as you have done enough damage and attrited or dislocated the enemy, that's it. Everyone pause, right? It allows for decisive victory. Eventually, you will attrit the enemy to the point that they can no longer function. It retains control of the initiative. You attack at a time and place of your choosing at all times. You set the tempo. What becomes a hard part is you have to set the start and end points of each effort based on conditions or terrain, and most likely with this one condition. This is useful because if your force is starting to disaggregate due to command and control or communications issues, you've set your conditions for pause already, right? You're not going to have anyone going out and doing cowboy stuff. And it allows transition, right? Since you're retaining your combat power, you can transition to maneuver or exploit as conditions allow. Its disadvantages is it results in repeated breaches. Therefore, it is incredibly engineer heavy. So if you're taking this approach, you got to go up to hire and say, hey, we need a lot more engineers and a lot more fire, right? Because you are doing that breach part over and over and over again. It is potentially slow. If you do not set these conditions right, it allows for overextension. And then we're back into the problems of Stalingrad and this, the deliberate assault. It also gives the enemy an opportunity to prepare a deliberate defense because you keep pausing, giving them time. And it has the potential for high civilian casualties. Why? Because the most casualty intensive part of the urban fight is that breach. And you're just doing that over and over and over again. Next slide, please. So let's talk another variation of assault, which is raising the flag. Credit John Spencer for the name, by the way. This is his name. He named this approach. What you do is you breach rapidly to key terrain within the urban space. You then switch into the defensive and force the enemy to attack you. See this in the Battle of Second Fallujah, the Battle of Inada, the Battle of Janine. Happens over and over again. Advantages are it maintains your cohesion. It allows for concentration at the decisive point. It alters the defense offense because now you're on the defense in the urban terrain and the enemy has to attack you, which is useful. But it does place your lines of communication at risk because you're going to have a very narrow line of communication from the outside force to the force that's gone in and raising the flag. It risks isolation of that force that's inside. And it really complicates CASAFAC because you're generally going to have one route to do CASAFAC, which is also the route your logistics are coming in. And the enemy knows exactly where that route is and will probably be attacking it. Go next, please. So this is another template that comes from actually the First World War with the idea that what is an urban space really from an operational planning perspective? It is a deep and complex defensive area. If we think about it in that context, some of the operational approaches that worked on other deep and complex defensive areas are also workable for urban terrain. And so one that was very successful during the parts of the First World War, where the trench lines were more than 10 miles deep, 
right? So we're now talking very complex defenses. Something called bite and hold, which comes out of the British, how the British learned after Psalm, actually. And what it is, is it has, in the First World War, the British and French faced a problem that we can talk about with urban terrain as well, which is they would almost always take the first line of the enemy's trenches. Their breach would be successful. And then they would either be defeated on a counterattack or fail to have any ability to exploit that. And all you've done is at great cost, captured a very small piece of terrain. Not what you're looking for. And something we can think about as we've talked about urban problem sets. So what do you do? What you do is you develop this operational approach that involves really concentrating on very small areas of the terrain, concentrating overwhelming force on a small area of the terrain. Go next, please. What you do is you mass overwhelmingly force, and then you consciously limit gains. So you do overwhelmingly force on one area of the city, take it, switch to the defensive on that area, pull back a lot of your support resources, and do another breach on a different area of the urban terrain. Take a small area of it, hold it, resume the defensive in that area. Now you've got two pieces that you're on the defensive of. And what you're doing is by repeated breaches in different areas, you are slowly shaping the enemy's defense to the point where their defense becomes untenable, at which point they would draw under their own volition because you have to attack your prepared defenses. That's the hold part. So you bite, then you switch to the defense and hold and force them to attack this. And so you keep doing this around to shape the enemy position until such point as their position becomes untenable. This is fires intensive. This is engineer intensive. Where it differs from colossal cracks is colossal cracks is you are looking for the enemy main effort and you are smashing into it repeatedly, repeatedly, very Clausewitzian. In this one, you're looking at the entirety of the enemy position and you're shaping it by repeated small offensives and gains where you mass overwhelming force at a time and place of your choosing and then constantly reshape them. This is death by a thousand, death by a thousand pinpricks. But again, this is not attrition based. So the difference is colossal cracks is attrition based. This is shape and maneuver based. You're trying to shape their position until such point as they realize they are untenable to continue to hold the position. So this is entirely continuous shaping. Next, please. So what are your kind of advantages? It allows the attacking echelon to retain combat power and concentrated. Tempo is your choice. You get to control it. It allows the massing of effects on decisive point. You're not dispersing your forces. Everywhere where you're about to do a bite, you mass the support resources. And then you switch to defense, which is slightly less resource intensive. Keeps your, the initiative with you, because the enemy has to sit there going, Oh man, they just bit here. Do I now attack it? I don't know. What do I do? Oh man, they just bit here. Now I've got another problem. So you create many, multiple dilemmas. It changes the advantage of terrain because you have the advantage at the breach and then you switch to the defense that provides you. Question. Did it reach is it is slow, right? It's sacrificing speed for initiative and tempo. You control the tempo. And in US doctrine, tempo is always reflected in against the enemy. So your tempo versus the enemy. So you are controlling the tempo, but you are doing this slowly. It limits gains and does not plan for exploitation. Let's say you've done a bite and the enemy has withdrawn in front of you another five miles. You do not extend into that space. You go to where your line was to switch to the defensive and you stop there because it's all about shaping. It is non-decisive, right? You keep doing this operation until such time as the enemy withdraws. There is no point at which you are decisively defeating your enemy, but you are gathering the terrain. Yeah, Jason. Yeah, I was going to say, change your plug. Tomorrow, I'll be discussing the Battle of Mosul lunchtime. The Iraqi coalition used these exact tactics at the Battle of Mosul to fight. Go. All right, go next. So what are your planning considerations? Maintaining tempo is important to you. If you do not maintain tempo on this, you cannot do this operation. 
phasing and transitions, right? This has repeated phasing transitions for your subordinate headquarters as they have to switch from the offense to the defense, offense to the defense, and you have to constantly move around resources to allow for your new breach, right? When do you transition to decisive operation? When do you transition to the fact that you have now sufficiently shaped the enemy and it's time to go, right? You can now beat them, or do you, right? It is also contrary to US doctrine. I will like highlight this because if I had a CAD person here, they would foot stop me on this. US doctrine says, we are maneuverous and we do not win by attrition. This is winning by attrition. The best you could say is it's shaping for maneuver. So you are if you've got a boss who's like, hey, I want a doctrinal approach, this is not the approach for you. Go next, please. This is potentially when you have an underwhelming force and you're able still to affect the shaping. However, you don't have enough ratio to attack. It could be that. It could also be where you assess that even though you don't have an underwhelming force, the cost of a deliberate attack will be so sufficiently high that the enemy is so well defended that at best you're going to do mediocre gains anyway. And that's where I'd really think about it. When the enemy's deliberate defense is significant enough that you're going to be trading a lot of blood for victory, this gives you another approach to save to cost fewer lives and to shape their defense to the point it becomes untenable. Right. So I will say the beauty of this approach is maybe you don't then switch to decisive. You just shape them into withdrawal. I would say this one, the way to think about it is it is about taking the terrain, not about destroying the enemy. So if Colossal Cracks is about destroy, is enemy focused about destroying the enemy, this is terrain focused about I want to take the city. I actually don't care how I take, like if the enemy is still has not culminated by the time I do. So let's talk about one of the ones that I actually rephrased, thanks to interaction with General Wooldridge, which is nonlinear assault. This is often confused with something that happens tactical level. It comes out of the Israeli ideas of the second and during the second intifada. It's often confused with the very tactical walking through walls papers. This is not that, this is higher level. What you do is you essentially have task organized mixed teams or bubbles with no fixed movement and phases towards operational objectives. So let me go into a little bit more what this means. You divide your force into independent task, combined arms task forces. They all have the same ultimate objective, but you do not give them phase lines. Their job is to fight their way to it as best they can. The purpose of this is to keep your offensive from stalling. What does this mean? If bubble A is making good and is going well, you throw your resource and your support by bubble, behind bubble A, right? Until such time as they run into significant trouble and pause. At that point, what you're hoping is bubble B is now moving. At which point you throw your support by bubble B. Bubble A switches to defensive, bubble B is now moving. And so at the division, what you're doing is it's giving you lots of options. Now, it's non-hierarchical coordination. Because if bubble A and bubble B are operating near each other, they should coordinate laterally without higher help. It assumes that communication, command, and control is going to be very difficult in the urban terrain. And so it creates more flexibility in how that coordination works. It creates confusion among the enemy, right? Because they're used to us fighting in a fairly linear manner. And so if you have these multiple independent bubbles, hey, who's the main effort? The answer is, for you as division or core, the main effort is whoever's working. Right, that's the main effort. Everyone else is supporting. It maximizes flexibility to allow you to retain momentum because you're not doing, hey, set phase line, go to this. What it can result in on the negative side, though, is multiple independent battles. Right, as if the bubbles all bog down, well, now you've got a whole bunch of different fights that are relatively uncoordinated for each other. So you have some classic examples, um, such as Nablus or the Battle of the Kospa in 2002. But there are also historical analogies. And these historical analogies can tell us some things about how this works. So in the Western Desert, um, if we had any French here, they would really recognize this. There's the Battle of Bir Hakim, where the French army, in, the French um, Foreign Legion, uh, slightly bigger than Brigade Combat Group, is given a box by itself and told, break water against the Germans, hold and then withdraw. And this was a favorite tactic of the British during the retreat towards Al Alamein. But it's also, at the higher level, 
used in China, Burma, India as division boxes. So Slim in the jungle realizes he will not have good command and control over his forces. So he creates these division boxes. What does a box mean or a bubble mean? It means there is no line of communication or supply. Your division brings moves with, or your brigade task force moves with all of its logistics, including field hospitals inside its bubble. So what does this tell us? It tells us tempo is important here because time is not on their side. There is a point at which you will need to figure out how to get these guys re, uh, resupplied. But before that, you're keeping everything internal to the bubble. Really effective also on the defense. So I used to believe this was something the US military couldn't do. Right, I used to believe that this was not feasible. But looking historically, we also did it in the Korean War, establishing brigade boxes, both on the defense and the offense during the Korean War. So this is something we can do. We just have to think about how do you make sure everything that brigade task force or that division needs is with them as they maneuver, right? It's got to be internal. Yes, General Walter. So um, the, and if you're far trying to follow along in your book, you will notice that this is not in there for the reasons that we just that he just discussed, right? I didn't feel that it was practical for you to use until now, now that we've kind of solved some of the issues, right? Um, you said uh, about, you said CASPA 2002? Yeah, the Battle of the CASPA. Um, it's... K in English, um, I'm going for K-A-S-B-A-H, like Rock the Kasbah, okay. right? Who fought in that? Uh, it's another Israeli battle. So in the modern sense, post-Korea, I am tracking that this has been used only by the Israelis and only during the Second Intifada. However, I would point out, due to the historical analogies, it can be used, and it can be used in a variety of situations. Yeah. And we're talking, you know, we use bubbles or, or mixed tea, you know, kind of going from going to Lisco now, scale-wise, are we talking like battalion, brigade, or... So I would say my two cents of it, looking at the historical analogies, where it's been done by the U.S. or British forces, is we're not talking less than brigade. And the reason I'd say that is it needs to have enough of its own logistic support to bring with it, right? And battalion doesn't have enough support elements to me. Now, the one thing, caveat I will put on that is if you think you can maneuver quickly, so if we have overmatch against the enemy, but we don't know where the enemy has concentrated their defense within the urban terrain, I do think this is a viable option for use with battalions, but only in the specific area where we know we have overmatch, but we do not have a great intelligence picture of the enemy, because what this allows us to do is probe, sense, and react all at the same time but it reduces some of those logistical considerations because what we do have overmatch. Yeah. That's actually, it's in 2002, that battle you were playing. Yeah. So yeah, if you look at the Battle of Nablus. Yeah, the Battle of Nablus in 2002 is kind of the classic example where this was used in a somewhere between a coin and not coin idea because they did have to breach and take the city against a well, a deliberate defense, but it was a militant group doing the deliberate defense. So it's a little... Like high level, high intensity coin, I guess is the best way to think of it. Any other questions on this one? All right, go next, please. So let's talk about infiltrate, right? This is another very, very classic one. There are a ton of examples of this. There's Shusha, there's uh, the one you'll hear about as a case study, Hui. There is Paris in 1944, where the Fighting begins internally with some small scouting units and uh, light units getting into the city without the Germans noticing to support the resistance. There is Marseille in 1944, which is a variation where it is timed for uh, special operations infiltrating the city to work with the local resistance to start an uprising and then external forces coming to meet it. And there's Arnhem where it is done by airborne right, to get them into the city and then have ground forces link up to it. Doesn't always work, right? There are some tempo issues with this, especially when we look at Arnhem. The idea is that either SOF or Airborne are going to enter the city together, hopefully with indigenous forces, and begin to fight inside the city as you begin your maneuver from outside the city. So it's an inside and outside simultaneous battle. So what is it dependent on for success? Weakness of internal security. If they have a strong internal security apparatus in their city, 
you're probably your thoth element is probably not going to have much success in beginning a substantive uprising. It's also dependent on what networks you've established prior to the campaign. If you talk to any of the SF people here, then in special forces, they're going to tell you, you can't send me in 48 hours early or 96 hours early and expect all of a sudden there's a network of resistance that you're going to be able to exploit, right? I've seen planners suggest that, oh, we'll just send in some SF right before they'll get some indigenous stuff going and it'll be good. Now, this is something that is months to years in the making to build the networks to be able to then exploit when you get to this level of operation. So if you haven't done that, you can't do it, right? So it really depends on what's happened in the broader strategic level of shaping. You can also risk defeat in detail, right? They could defeat the internal uprising and then turn around and defeat you as the ground maneuver element. That's not helpful. So it has a lot of risks. However, when it works, it works really, really, really well. Paris and Marseille being a really key example of it. Algiers also during Operation Torch being a really good example of it. But you need to have the pre-plan. Go next, please. So let's talk about isolating and besieging, right? If you can't, if you don't want to assault the city and you don't want to destroy the city, well, you're starting to run out of options here, right? And so one option is to isolate or besiege the city, right? Go next, right? There are tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of classic examples of this, right? Shake a stick and you'll find a siege in any given war. So what are the advantages of the classic siege? It avoids the problem of fighting in the city. You're just not going to do it. It allows for decisive victory. Some point, if you've isolated your enemy long enough, they will surrender. It has a predictable time and resource requirement. You know how long it, much sustainment you will need to keep your force in place there. And your intelligence hopefully can give you an estimate of how long it will take before the enemy will surrender, before they run out of resources. In the 17th century, Vauban, the French commander, was able to predict almost to the hour how long it would take a city to surrender. And he'd invite the king to make sure to come for the victorious capture of the city. You don't want to invite the king on the wrong day. And so he was very, very good at it, right? It allows for neighboring efforts, efforts to continue offensive operations. It does not have the kind of giant sucking noise of forcing more and more people into the urban funnel because you're maintaining consistency. What are some disadvantages? It's huge in force requirements. It significantly slows your tempo because you're just sitting there. It can create a siege mentality within the city of, hey, I didn't like the enemy who was occupying it, but now we're all in it together because we're all besieged together. And really, really critically, and this is important for law of armed conflict and moral considerations, it ultimately relies on the denial of food and water also to the civilian population, even if you have humanitarian resources going in. If you establish a humanitarian carter, what you're doing is you're establishing basic sustenance requirements for the po civilian population, but you're not going to do above basic sustenance because you know that will continue to go to the enemy eventually. And Sahar, you have a comment on that? Yeah, uh, that's true. I thanks, uh, Jacob, for mentioning that. I chose the prohibit sieges per se, but it does prohibit starvation. So the three considerations that you need to allow for food and water to come in, you need to allow for facilitated evacuation of civilians. Uh, so those are really important uh, considerations, otherwise you can be foul of uh, legal obligations. I have a question then. <clears throat> I understand um, allowing civilians to escape. If you allow food and water into the city, it's being Siege. The enemy, of course, could just take food and water for themselves. Yeah. Uh, there's a, by the way, there's an example of that in Somalia. We talk about black. Everybody focuses on Black Hawk Down, but why were American forces in there? Because of that very reason, we were trying to bring food to uh, for, to relieve, alleviate a famine, and it was warlords were taking the food from the civilians and, and feeding their soldiers with it. Right. So, but that's in a semi-permissive environment. Large scale combat operations. I would stop the enemy from just muffling onto the food and water for themselves. I think that would be a challenge. Sorry to. I mean, yeah, that, that, okay. is the, that is a risk, but do you want to be on the lawful side right. of, of prosecuting a war? Uh, and, like you said, very consistently, everybody's watching what you're doing. 
So I just see in Syria, and I'm sure you know about this, um, Jacob, that mm. in Ghouta, when there was a siege around it, I mean, the Assad regime was not allowing any humanitarian convoy to go in. So people were seeing needs to survive. And then eventually, after a few months of negotiation, came up with the armed the fighters and the civilian population. But it was really bad. And uh, I mean, again, these are war times. So, uh, so there's a deliberate starvation of a population into submission. And it's a, yeah, it, you know, the adversary can take advantage of your lawful tactics at any time. Right. Uh, but it's about, you know, worse political. So, you know, I think those things are. And I think that's where the how much you, I'm going to say if we're doing this, right, we're not war criminals. We're going to need to establish those humanitarian convoys and humanitarian support. Question is, what level are you doing, right? How much are you allowing in because of that problem, right? So you have to allow enough for the population. And so that becomes part of your planning consideration. And go next, please, for some of the other planning considerations that come in it. Do you have the forces and times to do this? To give the example, everyone talks about Stalingrad. Like every urbanista loves talking about Stalingrad. But let's talk about Leningrad for a second which is, if anything, to me, I mind, almost more important. To maintain the siege of Leningrad, the Germans had to maintain 700,000 soldiers in position for a total of 872 days. That is a huge percentage of your force tied it down. They had 500,000 casualties during that siege right, on attempts to break out, attempts to break in, et cetera. It immobilized, the force requirements immobilized the entirety of their northern offensive. So we could go and like, hey, deliberate assault is force intensive, siege will be much easier. Eh, easier maybe, more force intensive, also maybe. So do you actually have the numbers? Do you have the time? This is not a quick operation. How long can you maintain that force in a fixed position? How long can you have it not part of your force structure? How much of resources can you really cut off? In Leningrad, it turned out not enough, right? What is the likelihood that the enemy morale will collapse before they starve to death? Because if you're walking into a city full of dead bodies because they fought to the last person, you've just created a martyr city, right? Also, it looks really bad and you'll have moral injury, et cetera. So what you're really trying to do with the siege if you're the US is collapse their morale and get them to surrender. Do you have the intel to understand subterranean infrastructure? Are there other routes of ingress and egress to this besieged area that you are not encountering for? So I use the example of New York, the aqueduct tunnels from New York City stay underground for dozens and dozens and dozens of miles and actually emerge in upstate New York. So if you're going to effectively do this to New York and the aqueduct tunnels are big enough to drive trucks through, right? you are actually having to have a guard force hundreds of miles away potentially as part of this. So how big is your area? And can that force that you're leaving in place provide its own security because it will be subject to attack from both inside the siege lines and outside. So how are you securing that force? All right, so you don't like that. Go next to isolation, variation, control without it entering. Okay, I don't wanna besiege the city, but I want the city not to be a problem for the rest of my offensive operations. So there's a case in Bidge Bell in 2006. So you avoid an aspect of the urban fight, right? What you're doing is you're screening the urban area from the rest of your maneuver. You're trying to control by fire. So the downside of this is you do not have initiative vis-a-vis -vis the urban space. They will attack you when and where they please, and you're holding out. You don't have as many casualties, but you are sacrificing initiative. How long does this operation last for? until you've accomplished your other objectives. So you're also trading time, right? You're having fewer casualties, but you're ceding time and initiative. It creates a whack-a-mole approach to the threats emanating. They pop their head out to attack your position. You defend it. Maybe, maybe, maybe you penetrate slightly into the urban area as a spoiling attract. Maybe you don't, but you're constantly dealing with the threat emanating from there. It is best employed when there is no specific objective in the urban environment, i.e. I don't want anything in that city. I don't want that city. I just need that city not to be a problem for my other ground maneuver. And so really your decisive operation is the other ground maneuver that you're doing. Go next, please. 
Another version of this is to isolate in support of local forces. And so you've got a couple of examples of this historically. You've got a very effective run at Deborah Marcos in the Second World War, and you've got a less effective one, well, an effective one, but leads to massacres in Beirut in 1982. In this case, you are keeping your forces outside of the urban area. You are supporting a different local partner by fire and by support. So the way a division traditionally fights, intel, fire, support elements, you're providing that to a local partner force. But then you have to ask, how much support do you, will you be able to provide? What kind of support do they need? Do they need fires? Are you going to have a local force without your guys calling in fire missions? What might that do to CivCAS? How can you minimize support for possible war crimes? If the local force does not play by our rules, and Sahar, collect me if I'm wrong, if I take part in a war crime by, say, providing an illumination, providing communications to coordinate something that's a war crime, I myself am, in fact, a war criminal. Yes, I got the thumbs up from our Sivka. Got that one right. Wow. Right. Depending, there, on case, depending on the case. Awesome. You don't want to do that. So you need to ask yourself, what are going to be your decision? Because you don't want the battalion commander to have to go, hey, is this a war crime going on? Well, I don't, I don't know. Uh, do I, fire missions coming in, do I do? You want that to stay at division that has the authorities to make those decisions and the staff to staff out those decisions. So you do have to think of that. How long will it take for the local force to do their job? And are you willing to accept their failure, right? Anytime a partner force is the main effort, you have to ask, what if it doesn't work? Is that acceptable to our mission? Which is why, again, everything is driven by end state and conditions, right? That's your number one piece of op art here to think about. Go next, please. Then we have a variation which starts to get into combine where you isolate for the city for some time in order to set conditions for an assault or an infiltration, et cetera. It takes with some of these things that I've talked about where soft needs to go in, you know, year, months or years ahead, it gives you a different approach, right? Especially with a city with a large amount of subterranean infrastructure, right? It leverages special operations capability. So what you do is you do a siege until you create conditions that support an assault. You could infiltrate to secure key resources in support of the assault or key locations as part of that. But what you're doing is you're effectively isolating until such time. Disadvantages is it that those conditions may never be met and then you're in a siege. It also could result in if those conditions aren't really met and you move over to the assault phase, well, then your whole besieging phase was just useless because you're back to any of those assault options. But what are your key planning considerations? The ability of special operations to infiltrate. If I'm saying there are key terrain in the city that I need to seize and before I can begin my assault, and I want special operations to take care of that, can they do it? How long will that take? How long do I have to be in a sieging position before they can do it? Is there any key terrain at all? Or is this just a city that I'm going to have to fight through no matter what? In which case, maybe just get it over with and go back to one of the assault templates. And then timing and transition. What condition sets the switch from uh, isolate to assault? Right. This is a conditions-based decision, and you have to be very, very clear on those conditions. And then the last part is you lose any element of surprise. Right? They know you're going to come at some point. So you're not doing this at the maneuver. You're giving them time to build a deliberate defense that you're going to have to then deal with. Lastly, just about lastly, actually, we're going to get to bypassing. Maybe don't fight the city at all, right? We've just spent a lot of time hearing about why the urban fight is hard. So maybe don't do it. So how do you decide if you can bypass the city? Well, the first thing to think about is the advantages of bypassing, right? It makes the city the adversary's headache. This is our plan for Paris in World War II. We are not going to take Paris. We have no desire to take Paris. We are going to bypass Paris. We're going to keep the German garrison in place in Paris. And we are going to force Paris to stay on the German logistics network, right? The city, the giant sucking sound of food coming into the city that's not going to the rest of the German army. This is our plan. It avoids all of the problems. And it relies on the fact that the enemy will eventually withdraw or surrender as you've achieved your other war aims and operational aims because you've made the city irrelevant. Disadvantages. 
what happens if the enemy does not withdraw? Like, hey, we're bypassing, they're going to withdraw and surrender, and they're like, yeah, no, we are committed to this fight for the long haul. Now you've got to go take the city, right? Or you've got a giant pit of enemy in your rear area. Can result in unattended sieges at that point. And then you have to ask yourself, can you really bypass? And that's why I love Paris as an example, because we had partner and allied forces whose capital city it was. And so we're, you know, we're bypassing awesome. And the French army goes, we are so close to Paris. It is our capital. We are not going to let Paris die. This is our war aim. It might not have been your war aim. It is our war aim. And so we're turning right and heading to Paris. Y'all can either come with us or watch us start this fight. And so it literally shifted the entire US and allied operational approach for the entirety of the French and European theater. And slide difficulty here, but it is something to think about, especially in allied and partnered operations. Can you actually do it? Great plan, does it work? So I'll talk the next slides before they come up in the interest of time. I'd like to talk about really a couple of options here. One is a kind of radical option for fighting, which is to re-engineer the city, right? If you don't like the terrain, one of the differences between a city and a mountain range is you can re-engineer the city. You can reshape that terrain. Now, Drew, as a mining engineer, could tell me that you can reshape mountain range and possibly with enough equipment, enough explosive, that might be true. But that's a lot, lot more than might be in a division or core. However, core level, you can re-engineer the city. It doesn't have good MSR. What do you do? Make one. And this has been very, very effective because defenders tend to concentrate on the existing urban terrain. They tend to concentrate on the roadmap as it exists. Don't use that. Now, are there IHL challenges with that? Absolutely. Do you have to be careful how you're doing that under law of armed conflict? Absolutely. But a building exists only as long as it's standing. And a building can become a road with the right equipment and enough of it. And this has actually worked really successfully. It worked in Janine, in the Battle of Janine, ultimately in 2002, where the Israelis were stuck in the city and could not figure out how to achieve victory or extract their trap, extricate their trapped forces. So they used D9s to drive new roads into the city and use that to relieve those forces. Yeah. John. By drive new roads in the city, you mean? Demolish houses and buildings. Let's talk really brass tacks here. They drove the new the bulldozers through buildings to create new routes. Also to allow armor in because the city was had too narrow for armor. So they wanted armor. So they created broader routes that armor could move. It's been done historically. Paris, Napoleon III did it to Paris. The reason Paris has all of those lovely boulevards and big areas in large parks is because Napoleon III was tired of fighting an urban battle against rebels. And so what he did is he created new roads, right? And those broad boulevards. He also changed the road type. Yeah. All right. Before we, I'll keep talking, and the slide deck, I believe, will be available to you all. Another option for radic another uh, play way to do this is raid to displace, right? Don't try to assault and take the city. Rather, repeatedly raid it until such point as the city no longer feels safe to your enemy. This, this is an option for when you have, the enemy has an overmatch, right? You're really engaging with them in the cognitive area by consistently raiding and raiding and raiding the city until such point as they do not feel safe in their defenses and choose to withdraw. So what you're doing is you're attacking them psychologically. So this is often, this is useful if, you're, if they are heavy forces and you're light, if you have a large soft component and they don't, if you've got a good psyop component and they don't, right? Any of these are key enablers for raid. There are, again, tons of examples of this. Um, a good one to look at is almost any of the 1948 Israeli urban operations. The defender had overmatch against them, and they used this rapid raiding template 
to increase the anxiety of the defense. So the defender thought that they were not in a tenable defense and withdrew voluntarily. So it's about morale and it's about psychology. Um, and there's also the Battle of Karamed does that. What is this dependent on? It's dependent on the enemy morale and their organization. The more disorganized your enemy is, the better this rating template will work because it will look bigger and will constitute a larger tempo. The final two I'm going to talk about are two concepts that are really not within our fourth structure to do, but one may become so. There's a new concept coming out of Israel for urban terrain called um, the victory concept, which is their multidimensional, similar to our multi-domain concept. What it does is it uh, identifies three phases to attacking an enemy in the city. It identifies the first phase as expose, the second phase as converge, and the third phase as strike. What does this mean? The idea is that in a city, enemies are only exposed for very short periods of time. Right? They can go back into hiding. They can go back into cover. So really, your task force first job is to get them visible and to keep them visible for as long as possible. Second thing is to converge all of the supporting stuff we have, all of the goodness across domains on that exposed enemy. And the third part is to actually take the area. So rather than task organizing as single arms or combined arms formations, you would task organize your subordinate headquarters based on the mission. So what assets do you have in your formation that would, force the, would help you force the enemy to exposure? So that's putting reconnaissance, EW, SIGINT, really pushing that together in one part of your task force. What are your converging elements, putting that together? And then what are your striking elements and putting that together? Right, rather than thinking about a classic combined arms. Could you, yeah, sorry, we were messing with this. Yep. Do you need to go more than this? No, I think if there are any questions on these, I think we can handle it. They haven't finished transitioning their force to it yet. Yeah, so they tried this in the 2021 Gaza operation. This formed a component of it. And even though their formation is still arrayed as combined arms, they were able to use this concept without the task organized forces very effectively as part of the deception in the 2021 Gaza operation. They used deception and reconnaissance to force the enemy to expose themselves by going into subterranean facilities that Intel had already identified and that air power had already targeted. They used Intel and reconnaissance elements to identify when the enemy was in critical mass in those facilities. And then they used the strike element to destroy them with all of their, the enemy's senior operational leadership in them. So that is before they have transitioned their force in this model. It's using this model as an approach rather than a transition of force. And it worked very, very effectively. We'll see as the after actions come out of this last operation whether they also applied it there. I suspect they did just based on the tempo and lethality of this operation. I suspect they applied this model as well. If we can move to yep. questions for the next yep. few minutes, we'll stay on. All right, I have one more slide for question. Move for questions. The last one to think about is how the Soviets approached it from their lessons from Stalingrad in the Second World War that go toward Berlin, which is dividing their forces into three light forces to rapidly move throughout the city, take areas of least resistance, identify areas of resistance, assault forces, which are slower, moving in mixed with armor supported by artillery to hit those area of high resistance that have been bypassed by the light forces. And then finally, a clear and hold force, which mops up any bypass forces and starts governance, right? So that was their model as they approached it, as you get to the later part of the Second World War, from the units that learned from Stalingrad, it was very effective, but again, requires a change in force structure to achieve. Right, that is my last slide. So on to questions. Yeah. Hey, sir, so... Um... Looking for your... If you go to the next slide, it's got like my contact information and all on it. Or, uh, no, those were the hidden slides. That is, but it, watch out, whatever. You'll get contact information, I'm sure. Yeah, go on. Looking for your uh, opinion on the greatest flexibility for sustainment. I like to fight and vote. As a sustainer, I understand that that's not yep. doctrine you know. Um, what's your, what's your opinion? So I'm going to give you like a real Sam's professor answer, which is it all starts with end state and conditions, right? 
all of these options have a really useful way logistics can play in and give flexibility. But the answer is what are you trying to achieve needs to drive the option. So for instance, right on a 96 hour flexibility, the bubbles give you a great one because it's all there, right? It's time drives it and state and conditions drive it. I would say bite and hold. The problem is you have to continually make sure you can resource all of those different bites, right? If you don't have that capability, then it's not going to work for you because you have to maintain tempo. Colossal cracks is probably the easiest to sustain. Why? Because you're building up till your logistics picture is good enough and then only then are you salting and then you're stopping, right? So it's the easiest to sustain, but it has other considerations. So I'd say really the thing to think about here is your end state and conditions what are you trying to achieve should drive your operational approach 100% of the time. Yeah, John. From the bubbles concept, where do you see kind of the divisional level that is included in that bubble? So in the case of Imphal or in the cases in China, Burma, India, literally everything the division needed to sustain itself, plus fi added fires, so they get rid of core level fires, core fires gets passed out to the division. Everything the division needs to sustain itself for in that case, like a week of high intensity combat operation is in that box. So it's literally push, it's a huge effort. Now on the brigade boxes, it's a lot less, right? Cause then you're a brigade, not a division. But again, that gives you a shorter time that you expect them to operate. And what's another way, if you don't have ground locks, there are airlocks. Air Remember the Germans in Stalingrad? What did, what did the Luftwaffe say? I got you, bro. Right. Right. 550 tons. What, what 550,000 tons? I don't yeah. know. It was 550. Like 550. 550 tons a day. Yep. 550 tons, right? Delivered by air, the, the, you know, when they didn't have palletized loads and stuff like that. Yeah. So maybe the Air Force has got you, maybe not. Right. Um, also, Operation Market Garden, when Monty goes away from colossal cracks. The Air Force also had the resupply for that one, or not. So we're gonna, by the way, we're gonna put bubbles in there. We're gonna put bubbles, that's the best thing. We're, <laughs> we're gonna put bubbles back in there at, um, with this back into the- I lived I'm it. editing the gray book as we talk about, right? Agile organizations, good turn. I lived in East London for a while, and every time I think of the bubbles one, I feel like there's a song if I've been blowing pretty bubbles, um, just pops into my head, unfortunately. Yeah. So, uh, go ahead. <laughs> so think, think about for the next question. Think about what are the so of what he just covered, he went through like a dozen different ones. What does the United States Army do? What's our playbook? Deliver attack, deliver assault, and raise the flag. We 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 have to raise the flag in second Fallujah. So that that's an anomaly. That's an outlier that proves the rule. The exception that proves the rule and bypass. Deliver assault and bypass. So Dr. Stoyle just gave you 10 other options of what to do. And as you can see, he's using historical examples, right? It's the lexicon. Every, every, as he said, every urban fight is different, but understanding all the urban fights, the major fights that have gone through and why they were different and when they worked and when they didn't. Mm -hmm. For every plant the flag, there's a Suez, right? Why that, that deep penetration didn't work. And there's dead Israeli paratroopers to prove it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, is CAD, I mean, they're trying to revitalize division doctor right now. Are they looking at any of that? Let me be very, very open, and I shouldn't say this too much on CAD. Hold to on. understand your audience. Yep. Tell, tell them who you are. I, I'm the dot, dot D director at EPCO. Perfect. I do the brigade blow, but I got to plug into the division. So. The answer is sadly Leavenworth is a very stovepipe place and we don't talk as much as we should, right? I've, the CAD director of Mr. Deeds, great guy. I've seen him, had lunch with him, but we are not the academic schoolhouse side. It is easier right now for me to tie in here than it is easier for me to walk over to CAD and say, hey, I want a meeting, let's talk about this. So what I would hope you'd say is to enable that where you're sitting at MCO is to go, hey, heard this brief division guys, you should probably talk to it, right? Let's have that conversation because we're, the Army's, as we all know, a very large organization and is sometimes, unfortunately, stovepipe even on the same post. I can send that email to Rich today. Sounds good. Um, we talk about the um, sieging. Yeah. Is it 
it still seems to be a tendency to to think of what we used to be able to do. And yeah. We're still trying to do that. Whereas we can't be effective, as I said, we can't starve people out. We can't we're not catapulting you know diseased bodies into the inside the city walls or anything like that. It but, sounds better when you say that with the British accent. <laughs> 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 we sound that tricky last week. Uh, but is, is there a is there a modern way? And, uh, again, thinking thinking Islamic State going yeah. to Mosul, like the information campaign, and how effective how effective that was, and that 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 targeted probably the the diaspora just as much as it. Just so I think there's absolutely a modern way. I act because to me, and I think I rushed through this, but I did mention. Right, in a modern sense for us, siege is really targeting morale. Right, it's getting the enemy into a point where they understand that there is no victory for them. And so it's surrender now or surrender later, but you're going to surrender eventually. Right, and so you're right, we can't cut off food, but we can reduce it. We can make sure that humanitarian supply goes in, but at the level necessary, right? So it's not a comfortable day to be in there. And we can use, as you said, the IO, the messaging, to indicate that we're here for the long haul, you are now trapped in the city, you are going to lose eventually, right? And if you combine that with targeted strikes, especially against command and control, especially against organizational leadership, especially against their own, right, targeting their own IO assets as a very high priority fires mission, so almost reversing fires priority from combat assets to IO and, and, and psychological support assets, that becomes a really effective part of doing it. that you agree, because in Mosul, ISIS didn't want to, I mean, the humanitarian organization didn't want to deal with ISIS because of also all of the restrictions that many governments have by engaging with a terrorist organization, and their exception to providing humanitarian assistance, but that became a huge problem uh, in the Mosul campaign. The, 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 uh, the, the follow-up question was, gonna, was going to be to you, is that how therefore do we do um, how do we counter those kind of information operations? You know, because, as we saw with, as we saw with the, the, the collapse of the Taliban, uh, sorry, the collapse of the, the government of Afghanistan, um, and in Mosul, if we know that our adversaries are going to do this kind of thing, how do we how do we counter that message? And what do we what can we what can we do to both reassure the population and reassure the public force that we're I think one of the key things is to give civilians, let civilians know if they approach your siege lines, they're safe, right? Let Try to encourage civilians to leave, which is paradoxical to the old siege idea, right? And the old siege idea was about starvation. What you're trying to do is keep the civilians in there because there are more mouths to feed and dead babies in the streets are bad for defender morale, right? That is not where we are, right? So what you're going to try to do is the opposite, is encourage civilians to leave and then treat them very well. Right, because that will help your I.O. is if they come out and are able to broadcast, hey, every day is biscuits and gravy when I'm out of the siege, right? And I was on starvation when I was in, and I really always wanted to leave, but the bad, bad defenders were keeping me there against my will, right? That's a powerful I.O. narrative. So I think it actually has to do with what resources are you providing and what experience are you providing to civilians on their way out, and then how you can capitalize on that from an information approach. And then we just have three main Yeah. And I'd say actually even more than lawful screening, this is a really intelligent thing of targeted screening, because what you don't want to have happen is, hey, all men military age over there, women and children over there. And actually, I'm going to make a plug for a SAM student who did their monograph on thinking about using women and peace and security analysis as part of operational planning. And one of the things they point out is in some other countries and under other cultures, you have we do the women and children one way because we think of the women more likely to be the primary care for the children, right? And we have old gendered ideas about combatants that are probably not accurate and haven't been accurate for hundreds of years. But on top of that, in some societies, you actually have certain parts of the male demographic who are the primary caregiver. And so by isolating the men from the children, you're in fact denying them the primary caregiver. So it's, you, it, it does need to be nuanced in your civilian and prisoner management.